every time I've bought a course and I've bought a lot and, you know, I've, I've a TTP student, you know, Lauren, you know, the, the girl, what's her name, Lauren Hardy, her student. So, you know, funny enough, there's another REI Empire uh, coaching program I got sold on through Facebook and you just BS. But, you know, yeah, um, I'm glad, you know, I told myself never again after every single one. But really this one, I'm glad I bought. And it's really, like I said, it's really something truly different that you got. And if I had, a, if yours would have been the first one I bought, I don't know if I would have benefited because I might have fucked it up, you know, and uh, and try to do my own thing for a while. But <laughs> now that I've done my own thing for a while and know that it doesn't work right, um, yeah. you know, this is really, um, you know, this is really a blessing for me. Let's talk about Start about sales. So yesterday we covered some of our preferred methods for for lead generation. Really unpacking lead generation, figuring out how to align our current time and money into the machine. Uh, that is lead generation. And so once you have some leads being generated, then it's all about sales. It's all about having a meeting of the minds. And that's really what it is. That's really what sales is, is having a meeting of the minds and overcoming the wall of uncertainty because it doesn't matter how you frame it, how you position it. Sales is about helping the other party overcome the walls of uncertainty. Sales is about overcoming the wall of uncertainty, period. There's no ifs and buts about it. I don't care, you know, uh, what, what you may think, it's not about being manipulative. It's about being able to understand what those hitting objections are. So acquisition sales with sellers, okay? Acquisition sales with sellers is about surfacing hidden objections. And you want to bring the future to the present. Those are the key two things. If you cannot do that, it'll be really hard to actually get that acquisition sale closed. With that said, we got to build some trust. Right. So how do you build trust? Well, there's different ways. Self-deprecating humor is one way to build trust. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, hey Zuzi, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing good. How about you? Well, my dog had a little bit of an accident, you know, this morning. I don't know if you have any dogs, but yeah, you can say that, you know, I'm uh start a day not with the right with the right foot, you know, something like that. And and it's not like you have to be manipulative around. You know, hey, do you have a dog? I also have a dog too. It's just just about self-deprecating makes people laugh and just brings the walls down. And we're going to be talking more about that. That was just an example kind of off the cuff. So you got to build some trust so that you can actually get to the hidden objections. If you're not, if you're not doing that, they'll be really hard to get that acquisition so close. And you got to be able to bring the future to the present because you're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting against a lot of people, right? You're fighting against, I don't mean in you know, a conflictive way, but you know, you're competing, you're competing against agents, you're competing against the neighbor that wants to buy the house. You're competing about uh, with the, I guess, the brother or the sister or the distant cousin that may buy the house. You're competing against them deciding to rent the house or uh, for sale by owner or whatever it is. If they're reaching out to you, if we figured out that we have a lead that has interest, has raised their hand. Yes, I am interested in actually, right? I am interested in actually getting a cash sale, a cash out sale. Then, you know, it begs the question, well, if you don't sell the house or if you don't do this, how do you feel about that? We're going to talk about more about that. But essentially, I want to just share the highlight here that it is important for everybody to know that in acquisition sales, these are the main two things that I see that are the biggest problem on actually getting to an acquisition contract. Because if you fail to surface the hidden objection, if you fail to bring the future to the present, you know, it's going to be hard. Now, this position sales is a little bit different. Yes, there's still trust involved because nobody wants to be scammed, but it's more of a B2B sale than anything else. So the process and the flow is a little bit different because you have to, a lot of times, present logical, logical numbers. Like, hey, these are the comps. You have to present some facts because if you're doing wholesale, right, and you're selling essentially to other investors, which, you know, is mostly what we do, or you're selling on the market, wholesale, stuff like that, there may be some emotion there. But for the most part, 
it has to make sense. So you have to be able to present some numbers, right? And really the difference here is for the buyer side, fear of missing out via incentives. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Having that dangling carrot. So essentially in your disposition sales process, you want to have that or process that incentivizes them to take action, action, you know, in fear of messing out. Right. So I'm just going to, you know, go through a few case studies here. This is from one of our recent members that implemented some of these, you know, principles. He's already, he's already doing deal flow. He started implementing the, the sales process and these key things. And, you know, you can see right here, Joe, I cannot believe the velocity in which your program got so much traction. We're on the verge of three agreements from implementing your script. So this is from somebody that is not starting out and, you know, essentially made me very happy with that. So he's in Cali. And also I'm going to share with y'all a quick video of a, well, you know, um, are you happy so far with what you've seen? This is Jesse. I really, um, every time I've bought a course and I've bought a lot and, you know, I've, I've a TTP student, you know, Lauren, you know, the, the, girl what's her name lauren hardy her student some you know what's funny enough there's another rei empire uh coaching program i got sold on through facebook and he just bs but you know yeah um i'm glad you know i told myself never again after every single one but really this one i'm glad i bought and it's really like i said it's really something truly different that you got and if i had a, if yours would have been the first one i bought i don't know if i would have benefited because i might have fucked it up you know, and, uh, and try to do my own thing for a while, but <laughs> now that I've done this. my own thing for a while and know that it doesn't work right. Um, yeah. you know, this is really, um, you know, this is really a blessing for me for sure. So anyways, just wanted to share that with y'all because these, these principles that I'm, we're going to be covering today essentially have worked with other people for other people. Right. And so just want y'all y'all's attention to make sure that you guys are, are fully here. So, uh, actually before we get to the whiteboard, and if you were in the last session, I try to be very respectful of y'all's time and make this very neat and clean. Look at your, I want you to go ahead and, and review your acquisition sales process and your disposition sales process and go ahead and self audit and self check. Is your acquisition sales process inspiring trust, right? Are you surfacing hitting objections, right? Are you bringing the future to the present? Okay. Those are the main key things that I want you to go back on and review in how we're, you're speaking with sellers, right? Acquisitions is mainly with sellers, with off-market, whatever it is, seller. With the disposition sales process, I want you to go back and figure out, okay, how are you demonstrating trust? Notice that I say inspiring trust with sellers and demonstrating trust with buyers because it's a different type of sale. Again, B2C versus essentially B2B. So demonstrating, you demonstrate with the facts like, hey, you know, maybe we're off, like, you know, my bad, maybe we're off a couple of grand here, uh, but here's my numbers and here's how we came up with them. Just don't tell me, show me. Is With that said, we want to make sure that we are going through these steps and testing, okay? We're testing and testing and testing. So how do you bring the future to the present? You know, you want to go through these and you want to self audit for you to build a business. We're not trying to build a hustle. We're not trying to build something that is just like, you know, a grind. We're trying to build a business that you can actually then delegate to either local people or virtual assistants. The idea is that you have a process, okay, that you have a process. And so we're mainly talking about acquisition sales and disposition sales, right? Buyer FOMO, we're not going to be able to cover property underwriting, but essentially those are the key steps right there. Today, I promise you, if you at least go back to your operation and your sales process, then you'll get, you know, a lot of, a lot of value out of this. Okay. If you're clear on this, I promise you, if you're clear that your job is to overcome that wall, have them overcome that wall of, of uncertainty, your closing ratios are going to go up, okay? Nobody likes pressure, sales tactics. Nobody likes to be sold. People like to buy. And although we're buying the seller's properties, we are essentially having them buy into us. I've been through, I, I used to buy in person for the longest time. And I remember there's, there was this one property that I arrived and I spent an hour and a half with this guy. This guy was a Chevron engineer that lived in California and had this big, big, big house in um, Forest Cove, which is northeast of, of, of Houston, flooded Tapa area, big mansion house. This guy invited all the investors come through. 
I spent an hour and a half with them. That doesn't mean that you have to spend an hour and a half with every with every seller. Me starting out, I told him, if I you gotta pay me to buy this house. <laughs> it was that bad because it was full of mold, it was full of leaks, uh, vandalism. They had taken out the copper. I mean, you can bring them, you can, you can breathe on this thing, right? And we, you know, I ended up massaging my numbers and we ended up, you know, making an offer. And um he calls me back because I build the trust with him. And again, no manipulation tactics. It's really the same process that we're discussing here. But because we build a trust, because essentially we inspired our trust with him, we were able to get the trust and, and have him say, listen, your offer is like $30,000 below the other one. And one ninja trick that you should put in your acquisition process. Okay. Well, Mr. Seller, if, um, if it's okay with you, if it's okay with you, you know, without commitment, you can scratch out the buyer's name. I'd like to give you some feedback to see, you know, how, how our offers truly compare because in an offer, it's not only price, it's terms. And so he sent the other agreement. You know, it was full of contingencies, full of clauses, no proof of funds. I don't recall if there was earnest money, but you guys and gals, these are things that will get you an additional, at least, you know, one or two, three, four deals a year, depending on your lead flow. And it's, by serving as a consultant, okay? By serving as a consultant, okay? And because he felt sure that we were going to close because we had the proof of funds because we spend that time and digesting like here, here's the pros and cons, non-biased review. That's, that's the term I was looking for. Sometimes you'll get deals like that, right? Because he wasn't really all about the money. I mean, obviously pe people usually want more money, but he wanted that certainty. So Mr. Seller, how would you feel? Like That was a key question. How would you feel if in a month from now, this higher offer doesn't close? Are you going to be happy going back to California and having to deal with this and rebed people? Or would you rather take less, but go for the for sure route? And here's why, right? Here's how this compares. And here's the questions that maybe you want to ask. And so by serving as a consultant, a lot of times you can get, you know, sellers, sellers coming back to you. On the buyer side, what you want to do is, and I, I spoke about this yesterday, on the buyer side, the dangling carrot. The dangling carrot is the fact that Mr. Buyer, we are your acquisition, your marketing and acquisition arm. And we like to rely on our buyers to be our boots on the ground or get first dips if you close a deal with us, right? And it's smooth, we'll get you on our first dips program. And so by doing that, when you have that conversation and you have to vet them, you have to vet them with a non tortious interference agreement. We make them sign a non tortious interferes with me, meaning that they're not going to go around us. Even if we send them directly to the seller's house with the sell in there, they're not going to go around us. Why? Because investors only care about the deal. So if you understand that, hey, Mr. Buyer, listen, I need to get this sign that you're not going to go around us. I need to get proof of funds. And if a buyer is too lazy to provide you proof of funds, if they are worried or concerned about signing this non purchase agreement, you know, file, then these are questions that you really have to ponder on. Sometimes we may waive it for people that are licensed agents or that give us a good reason or come through referrals for whatever, but you want to put some filtering because if not, if you don't, if you don't put yourself in a position of power with buyers, they're going to drag you along, or you're going to get a lot of time wasters that may be wholesalers that are not really qualified. So we don't really even share our address of the properties nowadays with so much you know, going around uh, wholesalers and stuff like that. We don't really share all the details until they have provided proof of funds or they're a licensed agent and they've signed our non uh interference agreement. And what we want to do is we want to build relationships. Right now, you know, there's changes in the market. Nobody really knows, you know, how things may change from one day or the other, but we want to build relationships. So if we get a deal that, we close with this person quite fast, you know, easily with the buyer, then they're in our first dips list. And we spoke about disposition sales. You know, you, you got to show your numbers. You know, where did you get your ARV from? At least give me some logic. I mean, then just tell me an owner, show me, right? That's what you got to, that's what you got to figure out. How did you come up with maybe a rehab range? I don't like to give a full blown rehab budget because I got people that hang doors themselves and I got engineers that flip houses from their email inbox. So they're going to pay a lot more. But bottom line is that 
you have to go ahead and make sure that you're providing logical sense, okay? Fear of missing out via incentives is about saying you get first dips, okay? You get first dips, all right? That's the difference between the two, all right? That's the difference between the two. And so you want to only talk with qualified buyers. What does that mean? Your first, if you get a deal, obviously call real estate agents that have listed for flippers, do a flipper search in, in Aria Automator. We, we showed kind of what those pre-pulled down lists are there for. But when you have the conversation with the buyer FOMO is about, listen, here's how we work. We get you qualified once. Once you close a deal with us, you're going to get on our first tips list. What does that mean? My acquisition guys get the property under contract, right? And the seller may or may not live in the property. Who do you think we call first to get into the property? And that buyer goes, takes pictures for us, takes videos for us, and we'll tell them, hey, here's what we believe the rehab is or the condition of the home. We share the information. We're being 100% transparent. We need you to go ahead and take pictures, take videos from us. Here's our asking price. Send us the pictures and the videos back. If we can make a deal, awesome. If it doesn't work out, then you know we'll reassess, but we need those pictures and videos. And if it doesn't work on this one, we'll work on the other one. And it creates a symbiotic relationship where you're not trying to screw over your buyers and they're not trying to screw you. You are the acquisition arm for that investor. Okay. So that's how we're able. I don't know if that makes sense. Let me know in the comments in the chat if this makes sense that you guys are building relationships with your buyers so that they can actually be your boots on the ground. So that's, you know, we provide inventory. That's, that's what we do, especially on the wholesale side. So with that said, but one thing that I wanted to share with everybody here, how you're supposed to talk with sellers a little bit. You want to lead, and there's a really good book by Sandler. It says selling to homeowners. I think it's pretty cheap and, and, and audible. And obviously I'm a curator. I'm taking stuff from different stuff and I'm implementing, I see what works and I'm tweaking it. They really, you know, all credit to, to the Sandler training team around kind of this, what this nurture phrase is, right? And so a lot of times you want to essentially respond with a nurture phrase, right? Because it's usually an emotional sale, acknowledging it, and then leading with a question that reflects pain or pleasure. So for example, got it, Mr. Seller, I understand you want to sell in 30 days. So if I understand correctly, the house may need lots of repairs. Is that a fair statement? Okay, well, let me ask you a question. What options have you looked into in case we're not able to offer a cash out sale today, right? So you see how I nurture, how I acknowledged uh, what they said. So they feel heard, okay? And then you're actually asking for permission to dig deeper. A couple of these nurture phrases are, got it, I completely understand, makes sense, oh, well, really? This is all so that the other party in the other line feels that they are listened to, that they are heard. If you're just blabbing away, you're losing the sale, right? So the person that essentially talks the least and asks more questions is the person that is, that is doing the selling. Okay, this is called consultative selling. You know, acknowledging of understanding is reverbalize what they stated, right? Essentially, just make sure that you understand what they're saying and they know that you're hearing them. So, is that a first statement? Did I get that right? Does that make sense? Just want to make sure I understand correctly. This is not only important <laughs> for y'all, but if you really want to build a business, you need a sales process. If not, you're going to take every single call for the rest of your life. So <laughs> that's why, you know, you need to go ahead and make sure that you have a streamlined sales process and ask some of these questions. Okay. So permission question leading to pain or pleasure. And, you know, um, people like to lie. I'll just read this out to themselves because they do and others as a protection mechanism. Okay. So by asking open-ended questions, we start digging into motivating factors and decision-making factors that will help us customize the offer and close. Okay. So let me ask you a question, Mr. Seller. What if pain is not solved, right? Write that down. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Seller. What if pain is not solved? What other options have you looked into? I'm curious, Mr. Seller, if we were able to help you get past pain point, what would that help you achieve? Okay. Just by implementing these, right? And I'll copy and paste this on the day two worksheet. You guys should be able to get a little bit better of a response, all right, from your 
sellers and buyers. And I don't think, you know, I don't think that it is that you need to manipulate people, but if you don't have these basics down, your conversion rates, you know, will suffer, you know, will suffer for sure. And it's these little tweaks. Now this works better for vetted contacts with intent. If you are essentially, you said, okay, I'm going to be doing free outbound prospecting outreach. You have to be, it's not that these don't work. Is the, you have to be a little bit more intentful and aggressive towards the conversation, right? You got to make those calls, try to get those offers out. It's you have to be a little more aggressive on the offer making. When we are talking with inbound seller leads, you know, they are already problem where they're searching for you. You're essentially doing consultative selling where you're saying, okay, I'm helping you qualify for a cash out sale. Is it's me and you against our funding department, all right? It's me and you against our funding department. And so the idea is the more information that I can get and the better of understanding that we have, then the higher chance likelihood that I can get your cash out sale approved. Very similar to a mortgage, right? So let's say you wanted to get a mortgage. What do they have you do? They have you fill out these 10 pages of application, however they are, send me the pay stuff, send me your check statement, send me all that stuff. You know, they, they almost ask you your underwear size. Well, they're doing that and they're going to make money out of lending you money, right? It's a similar approach with inbound seller leads, right? Ideally, you're not seeming too pushy, especially with lay down leads, which is a key point that I just remember. We essentially classify Okay, we essentially classify leads into four into four buckets. So we get out of this thing. So essentially, so we got wackos, you know, these are people that not even Jesus Christ can help them like they're above retail, they're crazy. Um, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't even make sense for retail listing. And the sooner you understand and you can differentiate a, a suspect from a prospect, the better that is, right? So those are wackos. Then you've got retail seller leads that they have essentially no urgency. Their house is in showroom condition. They don't have timeline. They don't mind the showings. There's no inconvenience. So our motivated sellers are really all about choosing time and convenience over money, right? Then there's a the gray area, what I call uneducated, uneducated sellers. Okay. So uneducated sellers, they just don't understand the market, they don't understand the cost involved, or they want to pretend that their house is worth as if it were in showroom condition. But when you drive your net cash offer against what they would net, and they see that it's a pretty much fair margin, they may buckle, right? It's not, I'm not guaranteeing that every one of them may buckle, but if they have true pain and they have a true timeline and it's only a couple of grand difference when it's apples to apples, they may buckle. So what we try to do with uneducated sellers is let's say they don't take, you know, they're, they're not coming out to, to a number that makes sense. So they're not a lay down lead and we're, we'll talk about lay down leads here, but let's say that their house does need some repair. They do have a timeline and they ha do have a reason as to why they want to sell. Okay. Okay. Then your goal is to define with them, not against them, with them shoulder to shoulder and say, hey, you know, it seems like your, your net worst realistic scenario, Mr. Seller, is that you may, you may net 100K after commissions, after repairs, after closing costs, after holding period. Okay. It sounds like you may net 100K. Our cash out sale that I think I can get approved with our funding department, it seems that it would be $85,000. Is that $15,000 worth to you or not? Oh, how did you come up with that? Then you start pulling up the lowest sold comps. Now, Mr. Seller, I'm not saying this is what your house is worth. I'm not even saying this is our offer. But looking at these low sold, looking at these sold comps, they're similar size, similar bedroom. This one sold for 115, but they pay agent fees. And we don't know how much they paid on actual repairs. So that's how we treat uneducated sellers. The idea is to bring it down to a level, bring it down to a level that is our cash out sale number of what we think we're going to be able to get approved with our funding department and what what their net worst realistic scenario is and providing some logical around it. Because Mr. Seller, do you want an offer? Or do you want to close? Right. That's another question that you should ask. Do you want an offer or do you actually want to close? Because I could put a million dollars on a piece of paper. That doesn't mean that I'll actually close. So these are little things that you want to do. 
and say as you're speaking with these uneducated sellers. So figure out if there's a meeting of the minds. Without a meeting of the minds, it'll be really difficult. Another piece is, let me know in the comments here if somebody has been ghosted. If you've been ghosted after submitting an offer, let me know in the chat. Let me know somewhere here if you've been ghosted from after submitting an offer. Like you submitted an offer, they don't, you don't hear back from them, whatever, whatever, right? What's happening a lot of times is you are making the offer a little bit too soon or there's no takeaway. So what we do is let's say that they're saying, okay, I'm ready. This makes sense. Okay. This makes sense. I'm ready to move forward, to submit this to the fund department. And you're on the phone because we're trying to, you know, our acquisition guys, they get the seller signature first. Then I sign in right after a review. And when we don't drag sellers, if we don't, you know, if we underwrite it and it doesn't make sense, but my acquisition guys are salespeople and the best acquisition people are salespeople. And so they do have, yeah, absolutely. Everybody's been ghosted for sure. They do have the directive of, Hey, here's how you analyze properties. Here's, here's how you uh, essentially get to the number that makes sense to us. If you're off a little bit, go ahead and contract it. We'll review it and we'll give feedback. So a lot of times when the seller says, Hey, I'm ready send it over. And then when you're waiting on the signature, they say, um, no, I gotta, I gotta think about it. I gotta, I gotta read it. That's when you're supposed to go ahead and void it. They're going to shop you around. You should void that kind of say, Hey, I completely understand. You want to take your time. I'll just go ahead and avoid this because we do have limited funds in our funding department or escrow department. And I don't want to submit this. I can't really submit this until you're committed to actually move forward to this, but I understand you need your time. Now, let me ask you, what do you need to think about? Because if not, they're going to take that paper, they're going to shop you around, but by voiding it, all right, by voiding it, there's at least a little bit of takeaway. And obviously I'm talking about electronic signature, or maybe you can put like some sort of, you know, expiration date there. Does that make sense? Does that, is that any helpful to you guys? Cause I mean, this is, this is essentially what we do. And this is essentially the process that, that we use. Obviously there's a lot more details to it, but wackos, you know, I don't want to get my acquisition team frustrated with trying to convert wackos. That's what the auto follow-up automate, you know, we're going to talk systems tomorrow. You know, wackos are wackos. And we, we, we need to be able to understand and we, we still talk to them and we take them through the process, but we call that's a wacko. All right. Retail sell leads. So house is perfect condition. They don't mind showings. They don't have a press deadline. They want retail market. Then, Hey, your best bet is, is listing it. Now if there's some repair, some timeline. This is when you got to use the lowest comps and we're prompting and asking questions and really driving it down, really driving it down to the net versus versus your cash offer and their net worth realistic scenario. We tell them, hey, you may do better than this. This is your, your net realistic worst case scenario. You may do better than this, but I recommend budgeting because nobody really knows how much this may drag on. If you start rehab tomorrow, do you have a good contractor that will update stuff like that? I mean, contractors are a nightmare, people, in case you didn't know, right? So uneducated sellers and then lay downs. So lay downs, lay down leads, lay down leads. You actually want to hesitate. You don't, if you get a call and I, I wish I had the video, I'll, I'll plug it. I'll plug it. I'll plug it in the homework sheet so you guys can listen to it. This was a, a recording of a lay down lead in the Texas uh, freeze storm that I locked up for third. I think that was a 30 something K assignment, but bottom line, I digress. A lay down lead. You want to hesitate. So if you are on the phone with the seller and you know they have a timeline they got the stress they want to sell it needs repairs the number that they're giving you that would be their least acceptable you know number in the sequence you know that that we do there's probably we ask the the price probably two or three times in different ways to kind of get that then you want to hesitate you want to, you don't want to say okay let, let let me get that let me get that over i think we can do it let's do it da 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 you want to say really okay well i'm not sure miss seller I'm not sure if I can get this uh, approved today, but if I can, is that something that you're willing and able to move forward with today, right? And so they already inclined. If you if you get too aggressive, if your tonality, right? If you're essentially, they, they can breathe it. If, if you get too excited about the number that they just gave you and you do not hesitate, you will screw that sale up. You will, because this is phone sales. For those of you guys that are, that are local or have some local operation, you know, as I shared earlier, 
I used to have a local operation. You don't really necessarily want to waste your driving time, especially with gas prices as they are going to every seller appointment. You want to get at least some sort of baseline level negotiation established over the phone and then go for that additional 10, 20% or send like a local agent that you have a partnership with to do that additional 10, you know, 20% to get them to the number. All right. Um, there's really not a reason why you should be going and I mean, unless you're up for it, but you know, if you actually want to build a house buying machine, which is what we're after here, something that is pumping deal flow lean and mean, then you have to be time efficient. That is really just non-negotiable. So we spoke about wackos, we spoke about retail seller leads, we spoke about uneducated sellers, and we spoke about laydowns, all right? So with that said, figure out if you have these. If not, go ahead and, and, and start incorporating these, okay? Scripts are just scripts. I mean, they help, but having these principles embed, I hope everybody took notes. Go back to your process. Look at your acquisition sales process. Look at your disposition sales process. You got, you know, you have some hints here on all these um, sub-market cheat sheets that are downloadable. You have the links there as well to kind of guide you through that. You know, one key difference that I, you know, I mentioned, but I'll reiterate it again. Going after outreach, outbound is different than inbound. With outreach and outbound, you have to put volume. Like they already showed some intent because I, I told you guys, go after, you know, these type of lists, these type of free resources. They should have some sort of intent, but you have to be a little bit more aggressive. With inbound is where you can kind of lay back and hesitate a little bit more. So with that said, appreciate y'all. Let me know later on. Maybe send me a DM if you've got any questions. Love y'all. And I'll take much care. Bye.